欢迎你们 ，Bienvenue à tous, and welcome everyone to this webinar、uh, organized by Development Reimagined and the, the China Center for Globalization, focused on the outcomes of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation 2021, the eighth ministerial conference in a process which has been ongoing、uh, since the year 2000. Today we have a fantastic lineup、uh, of special guests, distinguished policymakers, distinguished experts who will be sharing their immediate reflections on what has、uh, emerged from the conference so far, and what that means for the cooperation between African countries and China. Over the next three years, what should we be expecting? What should we not be expecting? And where can we really、uh, start to take action and deliver? Before we begin, let me just also mention a few housekeeping things. As host, we have translation、uh, from English to French. French to Chinese, Chinese to English, and vice versa. There is a button for you all to use just on the bottom of your screens. Please choose whichever language is uh, most uh, useful for you to follow the discussions. In addition, we will have a Q and A session a bit later, which will、uh, offer an opportunity. For everyone to ask their questions to our distinguished experts and guests, and、uh, and also share your own comments on what you think has come out of the out of the meeting, what is what is good, what's remaining, and、uh, and and where you think、uh, we can all take steps together. My name is Hannah Ryder. I'm the CEO of Development Reimagined. And but and as we as we get into this conversation, let me quickly just give a a brief recap、uh, of where we are and what has happened、uh, over the last two days. I'm joining you from Dakar、uh, in Senegal, where we have just had、uh, the Forum on China Africa Cooperation. There has been、uh, the initial the first day. Had speeches from a number of different presidents, including the Chinese president,、uh, South African president, and also the chair of the African Union, chairperson of the African Union.、Uh, we also, and the UN Secretary General as well. Thereafter, there was a discussion of、uh, of key outcomes between ministers of foreign affairs and also ministers of economy and planning. Uh, so all of that has been happening here in Dakar, and、uh, and it's been an exciting and interesting time、uh, to be here, and、uh, given given the co-chairpersonship、uh, from China and Senegal. I would also that it's quite important that this is happening at the time in at this point in time.、Uh, there was obviously many international meetings have been. Uh, have been postponed or not been able to take part. Have not been able to、uh, continue completely in hybrid in online format. It was great that this was able to、uh, take place、uh, in person as well as in the hybrid format,、uh, so that、uh, so that different countries could engage together, African African countries, African countries as well as、um, African、uh, African countries and, and China as well. That opportunity for bilateral、uh, discussions is also important. So there are also those sorts of outcomes、um, which are relevant here. But given the COVID nineteen health challenges, the continued、uh, mutations and、uh, uh, and variants that we're seeing of COVID nineteen virus, we're also the continued need for economic recovery. It's very important to have the signal of what the cooperation between China and African countries will look like, just like any other development partnership. So I'm really pleased to、uh, have to be able to introduce this、uh, discussion of what the outcomes are, what they mean for us. 
uh, and what they also might not mean for us and, uh, and introduce uh, all our special guests to you um, for, for today. The format will be, uh, we'll, in it, we'll begin with a number of, uh, of keynote speeches. We will then uh, have a, uh, a more interactive panel discussion, and then we will move on to a QA and a uh, session. So just a reminder, please do use the interpretation uh, uh, that's available. Uh, and also please do get ready, send in questions and answers, uh, questions for the, for the panelists. And, and keynote speakers uh, as, as we continue. Uh, there's a button again also to, to send in your questions and comments. So now let me hand over to our co-host, uh, Dr. Wang, who will uh, from Center for China and Global, the China Center for Globalization, who will uh, introduce uh, this, the importance of this discussion and FOCAC to us uh, in even more detail. Thank you so much. Dr. Wang, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Hannah, uh, really for uh, this uh, uh, opening uh, remark. I think that uh, it's really a, a great honor, immense honor and pressure for me to welcome you all on behalf of the uh, Center for China and Globalization uh, in partnership with uh, Reimagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, African Reimagine. So, so today's event on outcome of the FOCA, yeah. Uh, as the most striking comprehensive strategic and cooperative partnership of the 21st century, the Forum on China and African Cooperation FOCA, since its formation in 2000, has been a very significant platform for collective dialogue between China and Africa and an effective mechanism for prag pragmatic cooperation. So this year, the 80s of forum took place in Dhaka, Senegal, from uh, actually at, at the opening presence, she delivered a video keynote at the opening ceremony under the theme, uphold the tradition always standing together and jointly build China Africa community with a shared future in the new era. So in this uh, President Xi's uh, speech, he said that in the run up to the forecast, the Chinese and Africa side have jointly prepared the China Africa cooperation Vision 2035. So this is very uh, inspiring <laughs> and encouraging uh, uh, vision. On its first three years plan, China will work closely with African countries to implement nine programs, including medical and health, poverty reduction and agriculture development, trade promotion, investment promotion, digital innovation, green development, capacity building, culture and people to people exchanges, and peace and security. So it's very wide ranging and comprehensive. The convening of this eighth edition of FOCA reflects the broadening of corporate partnership between China and Africa, which now I think in, encompass economic, cultural, security, diplomatic, technology, and health cooperation in all round. So let's uh, you know, uh, reflect a bit. You know, three years ago in Beijing, President Xi and African leaders made a consensus on building an even stronger China-Africa community with a shared future. Now, after three years of practice, and particularly after this pandemic, uh, it is undoubted that we do have a set of examples for building a global community of shared future. So since this pandemic outbreak, China and Africa has worked closely to contain the spread of COVID-19. During the toughest time in China's fight against the pandemic, uh, African states stood solidarity with China and gave strong support to China. Uh, and we re remember last year when, when, when uh, the, uh, this uh, virus broke out in China, African countries has, has showed great support to China. But currently COVID-19 vaccine access is a top priority for African to uplifting economics and boost development aspiration in the region. So by this November, China has already uh, provided over 1.7 billion doses of COVID vaccine to, uh, you know, 15 African countries and and also AU Commission to, uh, so to help uh, African Union achieve its goal and and vaccinating 60 percent of its African population by 2022. At the forum, uh, President Xi announced uh, China will provide another 1 billion doses to vaccines to Africa. So, so I think there's so much to collaborate with China and Africa. And, and China, of course, during the last decade, 100 
million people has been lifted out of poverty and uh, also living standards has been greatly in, in, improved uh, in China, in particular rural China. So China has also committed to share its years of experience in fighting against poverty for African countries. And we do hope uh, that China's uh, poverty reduction practice experience will support African Union's Agenda 2063. Another area of trade and economic cooperation are also are the cornerstones of China-African relationship. China has been Africa's largest trading partner since 2009. And also the, pro the proportion of China Africans trade with China in the continent's total external trade has continued to rise. In the first 10 months of this year, bilateral trade existing, exceeding 200 billion US dollars and they expect to reach a new high by the end of 2021 which will make China African largest trading partner for the 13th consecutive years. And also China's so growth e-commerce cooperation mechanism also benefiting business communities at two regions. Both Chinese and African enterprises are anticipating the opportunity to enjoy great mutual policy benefit. It will inject a new vitality into China African economic and trade cooperation. But also among the scale of change in the scene, in, uh, unseen in the century, a global governance system is facing profound and unprecedented challenges. China consistently sees Africa as a broad stage for international cooperation. Uh, the brotherly relationship, the prosperity of China will lend a new impetus to the win-win cooperation and the common development between China and Africa. As a matter of fact, last Friday, China State Council Information Office released a white paper titled China and Africa in a New Era, a Partnership of Equals. According to this white paper, from, 20 to, from, from 2000 to 2020, China has helped African countries build more than 13,000 kilometers of roads and railways and more than 80 large scale power facilities and funded over 130 medical facilities 45 sports venues, and over 170 schools. They also trained more than 160,000 personnel for African and built a series of flagship projects, including the African Union Conference Center. During the post-pandemic recovery, I believe FOCA will continue to serve as a significant mechanism enabling African and China economic boost. As China State Councilor and Minister, Foreign Minister Wang Yi said, Thanks to 20 years of joint efforts by two, two sides, FOCA is now a model for South-South cooperation. So both based on equality, mutual trust, and efforts, FOCA has expanded the China-Africa cooperation to a new domains and demonstrated that the potential of international development cooperation. So the ultimate goal of bilateral relations is to realize the win-win cooperation. Belt and Road Initiative, established a new milestone in China-African relations. African countries, African countries are a group of essential support and partners of Belt and Road Initiative. Meanwhile, BRI creates more possibility for African development. Both sides seize this precious opportunity to create by complementary between their respective development strategies to re-boost industrial uh, capacity cooperation and expand area of a potential cooperation. While the official launch of African Continental Free Trade uh, uh, Agreement, which also CCG has a uh, very uh, honored to host this with African Union Ambassador last year, it is not only a, a accelerates the uh, uh, international intercontinental economic integration, but also provides more room for enhancing the China-African cooperation. Aligned with BRI, uh, African Union's Agenda 2063, and the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, China and Africa will boost quality development and make a community of shared future in the new era. High-level exchanges play an important role promoting the bilateral relation. Even during the COVID-19, leaders of two sides have maintained the communication and the dialogue in various ways. The people-to-people -people exchange at all levels is also crucial development for foster a stable and healthy China-African relation. As a Chinese think tank, uh, CCG actually is in a, 
uh, in a really great efforts trying to strengthen the connectivity between China and the world. China has hosted, uh, uh, CCG actually has hosted a series of events and webinars about Sino-African issues. Uh, like we had, uh, I just mentioned the, uh, the ambassador's round table we had with uh, uh, African Union ambassador uh, embassy here last year, and uh, also Sino-African dialogue on challenge and cooperation uh, with Ghana embassy. And also we have received a number of uh, uh, African country ambassadors to visit uh, CCG. And also recently we did a, a event with you uh, in China on uh, uh, commemorate China's uh, uh, rejoin Yuan for the 50th anniversary with a focus on China-African cooperation. So all those events that shows that CCG is really uh, committed and very supportive uh, to China-African uh, cooperation. Uh, finally, I would like to say with an extremely young people population projected to reach 2.5 billion in 2050, Africa is today's world largest reservoir for human capital and prospective talents. It has a giant potential to become one of the most active and vibrant continents in the world. As the Senegal Foreign Minister uh, uh, Asta Sell said, FOCA is our common good. Its success will bring prospect prosperity not only to the current, but also to the future generations of African and the Chinese. So this year, 2021, is a significant year for the friendship between China and Africa as we mark the 65th anniversary since the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and African countries. Sino-African cooperation is not a short-term measure, but a long-term and faceted strategy. I do believe with the FOCA uh, success, we will be at another new chapter at this extraordinary relationship between the people of two sides. We look forward for the years as we continue the path of strengthening this relationship step by step and generation after generation under the frame, framework of FOCA. I want to thank Ambassador from uh, African Union <laughs> who is uh, uh, at this event and also other distinguished guests and also thank Hannah for uh, opening this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Thank you for your introductory remarks, putting this in context of the, of the long relationship, um, but also, also reminding us that there's a lot of detail for us to go through. Um, before FOCAC, before the actual FOCAC meeting, we had the white paper that was, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, released. And of course, at FOCAC, there's the speeches to digest and also a number of documents which have been agreed. This time, in fact, not just, uh, the, not just the declaration and action plan, which is as usual for most, um, for most FOCACs, but also uh, a vision 2035 and a climate change plan. So I think all of these provide really great um, opportunities for us to discuss what do they really mean? How is this a shift? What is going to be the future of this relationship? So thank you so much for your introduction and, and great to have the partnership with, uh, with Center for China, for China and Globalization uh, as we go forward. Uh, you're definitely making an impact in this area um, as, as, as we are doing our best to as well. Now, let me ask our distinguished guests, we're gonna have two keynote speeches, um, special addresses, and first uh, will be Dr. Ibrahim Asamayaki. Uh, who is the CEO of the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, are the African Union think tank. They help us to understand what this means for Africa future, Africa's future. How does FOCAC link into, uh, into Africa's development? So we're really, really pleased to have him uh, join us today to give his reflections on the outcomes so far. It is a complex set of documents and, uh, and issues to review, but nevertheless, I'm sure Dr. Mayaki will help us to understand what are the top things that we should be really looking out for and taking forward going, going, and in particular, an African perspective on what the future relationship is. Dr. Mayaki, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for inviting me. And I'm, uh... Um, for me, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to, to attend uh, this, uh, this interaction. 
Um, so all protocols observed, uh, excellencies. Um, uh, I will focus my, my presentation on the critical issues that can be seen as uh, uh, fundamental in the current period in which we are uh, within the context of the uh, Africa-China uh, cooperation. Uh, it has been uh, 21 years since the first FOCAC ministerial conference was held in the year 2000. Coincidentally, a year later, in July uh, 2001, the 37 Assembly of the then OAU, Organization of African Union, formally adopted the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, which is the predecessor to Agenda 2063. And it adopted NEPAD as an integrated socio-economic development framework for Africa. And uh, NEPAD became a program of the African Union uh, that uh, sought to eradicate poverty and place African countries, both individually and collectively, on the path of sustainable growth and development. FOCAC has always been based on a win-win partnership between China and Africa, whilst the NEPAD program called for African ownership and African leadership in Africa's transformation agenda. And this is repeated within uh, the framework of Agenda 2063. So as Africa uh, continues to hold much promise, and the past two years alone, we have seen an Africa that has demonstrated economic resilience despite the COVID-19 pandemic and recent global approaches. However, may I quickly state that the reaffirmation of this FOCAC summit to deepen quality investments into Africa sends a strong signal that Africa has a committed partnership with China. As I've mentioned in the past, and I now re-echo again, the China-Africa partnerships aims at an intelligent and systemic partnership anchored on the principle of mutual benefit between China and, uh, and Africa. The theme of the summit, deepen China-Africa partnership and promote sustainable development to build a China-Africa community within a shared future in the new era translates perfectly the high hopes and trusted on this strategic partnership. Furthermore, I commend and we commend from the AU side, the adoption of four strategic documents that will guide Africa-China interactions for the upcoming three years. The Dakar Action Plan, the 2035 Vision for China-Africa Cooperation, the Sino-Africa Declaration on Climate Change and the Declaration of the Eighth Ministerial Conference of uh, FOCAC. These documents will certainly serve as roadmaps and policy frameworks that will advance Africa's economic transformation. Certainly, if Africa is to lead its own industrialization, we must ensure that the 2035 vision for, Af for China-Africa cooperation can also attract non-traditional financing. With global regulations reducing the amount of bank capital available for Africa's infrastructure, institutional investors, it is the pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, have emerged as a potentially mainstream financing source to close the estimated infrastructure finance gap in Africa. And as the chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musafaki uh, reiterated in his uh, speech during the conference, infrastructure development is a fundamental priority for the continent. Uh, but critical African public sector objective is to mobilize both domestic and global institutional investment for African infrastructure assets, especially those projects which provide the backbone of Africa's regional integration, trade, investment, and competitiveness, especially as we go 
into the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. What Africa needs is intelligent financing. Intelligent financing will count in count on amounts of Chinese public funds, Chinese private capital, particularly Chinese, China's highly liquid domestic commercial banks, pension funds, and other financial entities. Therefore, Africa will have to position itself so that China's total imports from Africa of crude oil and mineral supply, which will reach $300 billion in the next three years, how to significantly contribute meaningfully to Africa's overall economic transformation and benefit the African citizen. Intelligent financing, backed by a comprehensive financial guarantee mechanism, will pave the way for more projects to be implemented under our Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, PIDA. The African Union Commission and the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, through PIDA, addresses issues like regional road infrastructure, physical and procedural improvements at border crossings, port infrastructure, and energy interconnectors as uh, critical for the reinforcement of our regional integration. It is viewed that uh, in recent years, uh, business and consumer confidence in Africa has improved generally, but investment, trade, and productivity have not strengthened as expected for most African countries over these years. And this has a direct impact on both foreign and direct investments into Africa's development, particularly into Africa's infrastructure. The period between 2010 and 2020, during that period, Africa added 122 million people to its labor force, promising significant economic activity in key sectors on the condition but political stability becomes the norm and demographic dividend of a youthful and employed population with adequate spending power becomes a reality. Thus, a great opportunity for investment and trade exists for Africa and this decade can certainly become Africa's decade of inclusive growth and prosperity through FOCAC just the same way China did in the 70s, 1970s. Africa through FOCAC stands to learn from China's social and economic transformation. Uh, we are evidently extremely pleased that uh, President Xi Jinping on Monday said China would offer another 1 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to African countries and would encourage uh, Chinese companies to invest no less than $10 billion in Africa over the next three years. Uh, the pledge of additional vaccine doses on top of uh, nearly 200 million doses that China has already supplied to the continent comes as a welcome move to show solidarity with Africa in its fight against the new variant of the coronavirus known as Omicron, which was first identified in South Africa region, but which does not come from the South Africa region originally, as the experts now are uh, revealing. But most importantly, uh, what is critical for Africa is to be able to manufacture its own uh, uh, medicines and its own vaccines. So, Local manufacturing capacity in the midterm is the objective that we are uh, aiming at. And this is why we place a high importance on the establishment of the Africa Medicine Agency, which will set uh, the framework of regulation and allow to boost uh, medium and bigger enterprises within the continent in order to, to produce uh, uh, quality. Uh, uh, medicine. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, China will support this uh, effort 
of locally producing uh, uh, these, uh, these um, uh, medicines and these uh, vaccines. The relation between uh, China and Africa is a genuine relation. What we now need after some 20 years plus uh, of FOCAC is significant amounts of mass scale investments that will transform all productivity sectors of African economies, effectively making Africa a global player aiming at uh, uh, the role that China is uh, playing today as a uh, critical, fundamental, and very important global player. I thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayaki, for those reflections. And uh, I think for further proposals even for what we can uh, take forward from, from the FOCAC outcomes. You have talked about the need for scale, the need for intelligent financing. I like that phrase and we'll interrogate that further as well. The need, the importance of local production. And I think in that sense, of course, within the vaccine announcement, the 60-40 split uh, between 60 to 40% split uh, between what will be donated from China and what will be locally manufactured uh, in African countries is very important. And I think a signal of that, uh, of that confidence in, uh, in African local production partnerships. Um, but I think what you've also brought out for us today is really this sort of long view and the importance of taking a long view, um, but at, at the same time, aiming for scale, aiming for, uh, aiming for serious delivery. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Mayaki. I hope uh, you will remain with us for, for some questions and answers. And again, a reminder to all of our participants, we want you to participate, you know, you're not just participants to watch. Please do uh, share your questions uh, for our distinguished guests, uh, policymakers, experts, so that, uh, so that what you're, what's on your mind, uh, we might also try to address. Now, uh, let me pass, uh, ask uh, again, you know, very, very pleased, very honored to have uh, His Excellency Ambassador Raham Tala Osman uh, joining us from Beijing, uh, the African Union Ambassador to China. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, to share your reflections from Beijing. And of course, you have been heavily involved in all of the work leading up to the outcomes here in Dakar. Uh, so please share with us your reflections. Where have we come? What did we want? Was it, was it sufficient? Um, and and what, what should we be expecting uh, as, as Africans on this? Thank you, Your Excellency. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, distinguished guests, Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki, colleagues and friends, it gives me great pleasure to join you virtually this afternoon on the outcomes afternoon in China, not there, on the outcome of the eighth forum of China-Africa cooperation. As the African Union ambassador to China, I first extend my thanks to, all, to you all for joining this timely event. I'm looking forward to a very fruitful dialogue this afternoon. I would also like to take a moment to thank our colleagues at the Development Reimagined who have been working tirelessly to, in the run-up for FOCAC in supporting the African and Chinese officials and stakeholders in coordinating our engagement. I would like also to thank the Center for China and Globalization for supporting this webinar which is greatly appreciated. The AIDS FOCAC is markedly different to our previous forums. We are facing a critical time in Africa, economic and social development. As COVID-19 has spread across the world, it has exposed a range of strengths to Africa, to African continent, including our proactive response to health threats. However, COVID-19 has also shown a light 
on what more needs to be done to ensure the development of our economies to best protect and support our citizens. In this sense, COVID-19 also offers a chance to reset, to strengthen our economies and development as we recover. The fact is COVID-19 has only made my work here in China more urgent and necessary, which is to help coordinate and share the African Union member states collective views on poverty reduction and sustainable development with Chinese stakeholders and to engage Chinese stakeholders actively in our priorities and development plans. FOCA 8 has also indeed been a unique opportunity for African countries to articulate our cooperation needs towards China. Our ambassadors, including with support from the, the development reimagine, have gathered and formulated new announcement, commitments and initiatives whereas we are at this COVID-19 moment. These demands have been effectively translated into new and important developments in our cooperation with China. Indeed, it is important for all governments, businesses, and citizens to digest and understand these developments which have been released over the last past two days. As a comprehensive understanding can inform us to shape the outcome we want post focac to be set uh, to best meet our needs and ensure implementation of what has been agreed. This is why panels and open discussions such as this one are so important. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, our task is more challenging. We are not just digesting speeches and the declaration and the action plan, but also two new key documents, the Vision 2035 and the Climate Change Declaration. These are welcome, brand new visions that provide a clear basis, a benchmark, taking both Africa and China long-term sustainable development plans into account. So let me emphasize eight key points from this eighth focus, taking a holistic view and setting a further context for our discussion here today. First, there have been several key developments in our negotiations compared to previous FOCAC meetings. We have successfully negotiated significant commitments, including 1 billion COVID-19 vaccines, green lens for our agricultural exports, 10 billion in credit lines and 10 billion SDR allocation from China to Africa and more. Such commitments cannot be underestimated, both in terms of their impacts on African development, as well as the benefits they provide to Chinese stakeholders in shaping their business and consumer opportunities with our continent. Second, for me, in my role as the African Union ambassador to China, one of the most critical developments is the inclusion of the African Union's six continental frameworks, as well as working with AU's development agency. NEPAD, led by His Excellency Dr. Mayaki, who just spoke before me. In the China-Africa Cooperation Vision 2035 documents, this is instrumental for supporting our Africa-led development agenda and coordinates with our goals and outcomes aligned to our continental, regional, and national development plans. Third, New financial commitments have been made from China in spite of narrative suggestion, suge narratives suggesting China's support for Africa development is waning. For example, the action plan makes clear China's explicit continued commitment to concessional loans for Africa's regional infrastructure development. I am particularly excited about the willingness to support 10 regional connectivity projects 
announced by His Excellency President Xi Jinping. As our great West African sister, Nobel Prize winner, and former president of Liberia, Madame Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, once said, if your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. Our infrastructure and development dreams are big. They must be. Our land is three times the size of China. We need infrastructure that will serve 2.5 billion people by 2050. Right now, we lack basic electricity to serve 600 million people. Fourth, the plans see our part partnerships with China move into new sectors or areas. The emphasis on digital cooperation in the plan of action is key, and rightly so. The internet is a force for good and enabler for trade creator of jobs, and in the wake of COVID-19, with lockdowns and travel restrictions, it has become an essential need for our lives and prosperity, including for school children. So we are keen to see how we can take this forward. Fifth, the FDI targets in His Excellency President Xi Jinping's speech and the Vision 2035 document are crucial. Africa's Agenda 2063 envisions the continent being the third largest economy globally and taking over from China to be the world's future manufacturing hub with a greener, more environmentally friendly home. China's pledge for an additional 60 billion for foreign direct investment by 2035 added to the existing over 40 billion will be key to this. We must work together to ensure this transition continues through local manufacturing, continued Chinese investment into value addition so that Chinese entrepreneurs and seasoned business leaders may flourish on our continent while creating decent jobs for our local people and boosting both productivity and value of African exports. Six, the vaccine and trade commitment, such as the green lens for our agricultural exports are highly significant. From an African perspective, we do not want China to simply be our largest bilateral trade partner. We want China to be our largest destination for our exports. The target in His Excellency Xi's speech and the vision documents are a significant step towards making this happen. Seventh, there are definitely some areas of our partnerships that remain unclear. Tourism, for instance, and the return of African students to China, given the continued COVID-19 context and emergence of new variants, it is too uncertain to make commitments in these areas. Nevertheless, I'm confident that and especially with the boost in vaccines that the new commitments indicate to our continent, we will continue to keep this open. And in the meantime, the more limited, the more limited but new opportunities for Africa, for African professionals and students to work in China, included in the outcomes are highly welcome. And again, where a key us for, from our side in order to ensure an equal partnership. The last and finally, the biggest issue is who, is how. Our citizens are always calling for more understanding of the relationship. Our business is too. The fact is the commitments made at FOCAC will not be led by those of us in the FOCAC forum on the FOCAC room in Dhaka, Beijing or online. They will be led by our citizens and business. I'm hopeful that in this discussion and in the coming weeks, as we all digest the findings, we can also gather ideas for how to strengthen the delivery, implementation and monitoring of the commitments made over the last two days 
especially from the African side. As I finish, I would like to leave you with one last quote by our great Senegalese leader, poet and artist, the first president of the Republic, the late Leopold Senghor, who once said, I quote, we do not inherit the land from our parents. We borrow it from our children, unquote. The success of FOCAC 8 in Senegal, despite the challenges of COVID-19 is a testament to our strong commitment to continue advancing our existing relations. But the fact is our youth must benefit. We must ensure that cooperation is of the highest quality so that it is in fact not just borrowing from our children. It becomes a gift to our children. I believe we are on the road to achieving this, but we must work hard and push ourselves on all sides to keep doing better. I thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, you have reminded us of the commitment, the responses to the, the point about having an equal partnership, um, but you have also helped elaborate eight different areas that we can really focus on in terms of the future uh, discussions and the future for the next three years, bringing together uh, all of the different documents and the speeches. Uh, we're very, very pleased that you've managed to do that for us. Um, but also reminding us of the hard work ahead, I think is, is, is very useful and very important for us to bear in mind. So thank you so much. Um, now, with those holistic perspectives, the importance of scale, the importance of working hard to take forward the agreements, the importance of being more intelligent about uh, what we are working on together, the importance of what and what does equal partnership mean, in fact. Let us now move to our panel discussion. This is the second part of our webinar today, where we will have further reflections uh, from, the, from, uh, from, our, from our special distinguished guests here on a number of topics. We have the opportunity now to interrogate some of the agreements on finance, on vaccines and the local manufacturing, on trade and industrialization, uh, on the digital connectivity, the impact of the private sector and business, environment and climate change, what does that mean? And also the people to people. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce uh, five different uh, panelists who will join us now. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Madame Malab Malada Kaba, who is the former economic and finance minister for Guinea and the CEO of Faleme Advisory Consultancy. Thank you so much for joining us, Madame Kaba. I would also like to introduce uh, Ambassador Go Haidong, Haidong, who's the CCG Senior Fellow, the former Deputy Representative of the Chinese Mission to the African Union. And thank you so much for joining us today. Let me introduce Professor Liu Haifang, uh, Associate Professor, School of International Studies at Peking University, a very good friend of ours. Thank you, Professor Liu, for joining us. I would also like to introduce Dr. Sheikh Tidian Die, who is the Executive Director of the African Center for Trade, Integration and Development who's also joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Dia. And last but not least, Professor Tang Xiaoyang, Professor and Chair in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. So again, a, a, a continued suggestion for, uh, panel, for the participants in our audience, distinguished, uh, audience, please do also share your questions. Continue to share your questions for this pan for this panel. But as the as the uh, chair of this discussion, I will take the chair's prerogative to first put a few questions to our to our distinguished panelists um, to to kick off the discussions and kick off the further reflections, having uh, had the um, 
having had the introductions uh, from our from our special special guests earlier. Um, Madame Kaba, maybe I could start with you. Um, because of course, what's on many people's minds is the finance. And Dr. Mayanki talked about intelligent finance. Um, what do you read from the outcomes on finance? What do you feel has been the, the progress? Is there, do you, is there excitement, disappointment? What are the challenges ahead? Um, what do you read from it? Madam Kaba, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, dear ambassadors, uh, distinguished panelists, dear participants. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. I'm very pleased to be uh, to take part into these discussions uh, following the uh, ministerial uh, conference on Africa-China uh, cooperation that was held um, uh, two days ago. Um, before answering your question, I think it is important to put this um, uh, this, this summit back into context, and especially looking at uh, what our continent has been experiencing. So as many, uh, as my predecessors already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we have, we still, we, there is this pandemic that uh, still lingers on with a virus that um, uh, keeps on mutating. Um, number two, we also know that um, our continent has been, um, uh, has had, um, uh, be, sorry, the, the pandemic has had huge economic and financial impact on our countries. Um, and uh, number three, I think it is important also to be reminded of the security uh, issues that we have been witnessing uh, in some regions uh, of our continent and also the political instability that we've seen uh, uh, in, in some of our regions. Um, this being said, um, I think that against the backdrop of, of this, uh, against, this this, against this backdrop, um, these, the announcements that were made by President Xi Jinping are very interesting when it comes to uh, funding. And let me again remind us that, um, especially when we look at how you know, Africa can um, recover and, and build forward better. Um, I like to say that the pandemic has, um, has been a nemesis for us Africans. It has uh, been a stark reminder of our economic vulnerabilities. We do not trade um, enough with each other. Uh, we know that intra-African trade stands at 15% of total Africa's trade against 60% uh, when we look at the European and Asian regions, for instance. We do not add value to what we grow or extract from our soils. Uh, we do not transform enough. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we do not have a wide economic diversification uh, base. And this does not allow us to increase our ability to weather future external shocks because we know there will be other external shocks. So this being said, when we look at some of the proposals that were put on the, some of the pledges that were put on the table by China, uh, we understand first that China remains a vital partner to Africa. Uh, and I think that it's important to, to say it. Um, and when we look, for instance, at the trade finance, the $10 billion that has been pledged, um, I think this is important because it, it actually uh, amounts to, um, uh, it, it accounts for 12.5% of uh, Africa's total, uh, current uh, trade finance gap, uh, which is estimated at $80 billion. So this is absolutely welcome in a context where we saw this year, in, in January this year, uh, the African continental free trade area entered into force despite the pandemic. Um, and I think that this signals a, a strong will and, and unwavering determination from our leaders to implement um, a complex yet absolutely crucial agreement for us to boost uh, uh, economic integration. Um, and I think that what, what would be probably needed here uh, from, from um, the work that needs to be done by both parties, uh, uh, Chinese and African parties, it, it's to understand, is to unpack the details of that funding. Um, I, I also welcome the, the, the fact that there is uh, already a, an identification of 10, uh, well, th there has been a commitment to fund 10 regional 
uh, programs. And I think that what particularly is important here for me um, is to uh, probably on the African side to be able to identify economic projects of common interests. Uh, and I think that the funding should be geared towards that. As, a, as just an, as an example, uh, when we look at what was done um, e uh, at the EU level with Airbus, uh, this was a project of common interest for uh, um, several um, European countries, uh, you know, where they decided that uh, some part, different parts and different components of that plane would be produced in different EU countries. Why can't we just, you know, try to identify uh, similar projects, um, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 and really leverage the comparative advantages that our countries have? And a number, uh, sorry, a second point that have, uh, I found also very interesting is the, the $10 billion uh, to be provided uh, to um, uh, African financial institutions. This is particularly interesting, and I think it, 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 um, it links back to what um, uh, Ambassador Mayaki uh, spoke about when he, when, he, when, he spoke, when he mentioned, and I quote him, uh, you know, we need, to, uh, we need to have intelligent funding. Um, I think it's very important for us also to diversify the portfolio of, of funding sources so that we lessen the burden on our public finances. And as a former finance minister, I know too well uh, that this is really important and critical for, for our countries. Um, but most importantly, and, and if I want to, I would like to answer that what makes funding intelligent is also the quality of projects. And that is important and we cannot, um, overstate that, 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 that fact. We need quality projects. Uh, I remember that in 2018, President Xi Jinping himself said that we need to stay away from vanity projects. And that's exactly what is required here. We need to increase, um, and this is where I believe that we need to increase um, and improve our, Afri our, our African agency. Uh, how do we select the projects? Do we ensure that they are the most productive ones, the ones that will allow us to create more wealth, create jobs and allow us to reimburse the loans, for instance. So I really welcome the, the, that, fi that funding uh, that will be channeled through uh, African, African financial institutions, uh, especially on the backdrop of the huge investment needs that we have in infrastructure. Uh, let me remind you that Africa needs about $130 billion a year to uh, bridge the gap in terms of infrastructure. Um, and uh, we also know that if we are to reach a, an average growth rate of 7% over the next decade, we would need to invest to the tune of 15% of Africa's GDP in infrastructure. And half of that uh, money should be put in the energy sector. So this really demonstrates the need that we have to bridge the gap. Uh, and, and even more so uh, that when we look at our regional integration dimensions, the dimensions where we fare less well as African countries are two critical ones, productive integration and infrastructure integration. So I believe that um, the, the, there is really here an opportunity for us to leverage uh, a Chinese cooperation, Chinese uh, uh, technology transfer and Chinese funding to bridge the gap in this area. Last but not least, of course, there's the, the special drawing rights and I, and I will end up here in a few concluding points. Uh, this is also very critical and I hope that uh, uh, other countries will follow suit uh, China has made uh, here uh, a very interesting and important pledge uh, because we, we know that macroeconomic um, conditions have significantly deteriorated last year and, and, and through 2021. Uh, there has been a, a, a fiscal, um, there has been tightening fiscal conditions for our countries. So this money uh, is absolutely welcome in order to, uh, uh, to loosen uh, uh, in order to actually alleviate the, the liquidity shortages that many of our countries have, uh, have experienced. It, as a concluding remark though, I would like to, I think there are three key points here. Number one is absolutely critical for us to, to be able to increase our African agency, especially when we talk about negotiating the terms of the loans that we, um, that we decide to contract with China. Number, Number two, uh, we also need to manage that tension between 
bilateral and multilateral, because I feel sometimes that we are talking about bilateral relations uh, between a country and a continent. And so I think we need to unpack this and be clear about what we are really doing. Um, number, number three, and, may, and maybe not the least, the need to communicate, the need to communicate and be transparent. Um, I've, I've attended, um, I, I think, on the, actually on the night of the, the kickoff of this uh, important ministerial conference, a space on, on, a, on, a, on, a, social, on a social media platform. And what was constantly coming back was the need to get more information on that important cooperation between Africa and China. And when we talk about that it's about participation it's about involving our citizens it's about transparency you know uh, and especially transparency when it comes to the funding and it's about accountability to our citizens first and then maybe to donors thank you very much brilliant thank you thank you madam Kaba, because i think what you've what you've shared with us is not just I mean, there, there's these questions about the overall package and so on, but the importance of getting into the, into the detail and really understanding what can these things contribute, what can the different pledges contribute, um, and, and what kind of precedent, in a sense, do they set? So thank you so much, um, and also for pointing out where the work is that we need to do right now. Um, coming out of coming out of the out of the conference, both on the on the African side, especially, but also also on the Chinese side, there's there's still plenty um, to to do to make this partnership really work. Um, so that's finance, and again, and encouraging encouraging the audience to to share their thoughts, um, and again, a reference to intelligent financing there as well. Um, Ambassador Go, Ambassador Go Hao Dong, your reflections, and you know, you were uh, the deputy representative of the Chinese mission to the African Union. Of course, understanding the African Union's agenda 2063 has been very important. Um, and His Excellency Osman was also setting out exactly that. And Dr. Mayaki was also talking about the reference to uh, about PIDA, the infrastructure. Uh, agreement and uh, infrastructure framework uh, for uh, for for the African African continent as a whole, uh, and then uh, Madame Kaba was also talking about the importance of African agency. Um, Ambassador Go, where do you think that that is going in terms of how do how do we get more communication to make sure that these outcomes uh, are, are delivered? How do we have more people to people exchange in a sense for that to happen, especially as COVID-19 is going, continuing? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to express my gratitude to the CCG and the uh, development, development we imagined for inviting me to uh, join this uh, webinar. Uh, very glad to be, you know, a kind of uh, feeling of being back home. Uh, Ambassador Osman, uh, nice to see you again. As we, we saw each other last time in Yanan, and it's about the poverty relief. And also uh, some other friends, as uh, in Africa, we always say, you know, all protocols observed. I love that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, you know, this uh, FOCAC in Dhaka uh, definitely uh, inputs new vigor or incentives for uh, the development and cooperation in many areas, such as uh, you know, the, the, the manufacturing, the trade, agriculture, and you know, poverty relieving. And of course, uh, I will assist in many ways in fulfilling the African Union vision 2063. Uh, and also China uh, will uh, benefit a lot uh, from the roadmap uh, on this FOCAC meeting. I first, uh, I, I have been long engaged in uh, in African issues. I, I first came to Africa in the year 90, 1999. That is one year before the, the birth of FOCAC. 
Uh, so these years I, I, I witnessed the development of FULCAC, uh, which has been a very, very important uh, uh, platform for decision making. And more importantly, uh, deliver. You know, it's a, FULCAC is not a platform for just chatting. You know, it's a, it's a platform, it's a, a way of deliver all the strategies and the decision make, decisions made. Uh, I saw many uh, in many areas they are uh, uh, the, the, the development, but instead of talking about other things, I would like to uh, focus on the people to people uh, relations. You know, see, uh, I've been in Africa for many years, 14 years in five uh, African countries. I, I, I saw one thing, you know, which might be not necessarily ignored, but less attention has been paid. That is the people to people relations. So as Dr. Uh, Ambassador Osman mentioned, you know, how the, for the roadmap, the brilliant roadmap, who and how. So that's remind me of thinking of, you know, like the, the people to people relations. My long-term experience in Africa, uh, uh, has, has has told me that you know we, we 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 didn't do it very well in this area, frankly. You know, for example, well, every I uh, well, I had some friends visiting China for the first time. Then they came back to my office in Africa. They they told me those oh, the picture in my mind is so different from uh, what I've seen in China this time. The same story took uh, took place to uh, happen to the Chinese. You know, when the Chinese people they travel to Africa, they say, "Oh, what I've seen in Africa is so different from from this." You know, all the pictures uh, about China and Africa, you know, are confined or or, or by you know uh, by the media, especially European American media. You know, frankly, I, when when people talk. Uh, about Chinese movie, they know only about Jack Chen, Bruce Lee. You know, when the Chinese people are talking about Africa, you know, they mention that, you know, uh, some, some African movies uh, like the Blood Diamonds or Out of, Afri Out of Africa. Of course, that's, a, that's very, very uh, beautiful movies. Yeah. But that's far from being enough. You know, uh, my experience in, in Africa uh, quite encouraging in some way. For example, you know, we, uh, I found that uh, actually the uh, African people love Chinese. Uh, we understand we we have some very similar uh, similarities uh, in the in the mindset sometimes uh, in mentality. The, the, we have similar sense of humor. For example, the family ties. We have similar family ties. Uh, the value, the culture, and the history, of course. You know, as there is, uh, when I was working in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, there was a TV series, it's a feature, a feature a TV series, I, uh, called Dodo and her mother-in-law. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Xifu de Xingfu Shi Guang. It was translated to Swahili language. It's so popular, so popular. You know, uh, everyone knows about Dodo. So I, so I think we we uh, for uh, to establish the long term, uh, you know, the roadmap. Of course, the roadmap is a brilliant made. It's kind of I call it uh, hardware, but for the software. That is the people-to-people -people relations. The two people-to-people -people exchanging is really a kind of heart-to-heart, -heart, you know, exchange. So that is uh, very, very important. We must to, we must do more. So I just uh, 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 stop here and uh, we will uh, later on to further uh, uh, deliberate. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Goldasher, because. 
I think what you reminded us in, and, and it links also to what the African Union ambassador was mentioning, there is a strong, a new element uh, in the in the FOCAC uh, outcomes in terms of the, especially digital cooperation, but also people to people um, cooperation, but slightly different forms because of COVID-19. And we have to be ready for that scenario, which is also why the digital cooperation is so important for that to kind of move up the agenda, I would say. Um, but not just in terms of uh, not just in terms of the e-commerce, or but also sharing things like uh, like the cultural aspects, the films, and so on. So thank you very much for for helping us uh, understand that part uh, of the uh, of the ambition there. Thank you. Um, talking of e-commerce, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Diaye, uh, we have seen a number of commitments in the in the uh, in the speeches and declarations also on trade and e-commerce um, agriculture green lanes um, what's your interpretation of those could they are they going to help will they make a difference have we seen these before over to you dr dear thank you thank you very much uh, anna for inviting me to this conversation. I would like to thank also your team and to welcome all the panelists to this uh, um, um, webinar. You know, there is much to, to be said on the Africa-China uh, trade partnership. Uh, one is that uh, this partnership has given uh, Africa a, um, a tremendous opportunity to diversify its trade partners. Uh, in, in the recent years, as we, as we observed, which has increased the room of maneuver of African countries and also their political space for negotiating, including vis-a-vis -vis the, the traditional partners, notably the Western countries and so on. And it is said that uh, when you have an alternative, you can negotiate better. And China uh, becomes an alternative for Africa because of the uh, the, the trade uh, partnership that is now very strong. But what is also remarkable on this relationship is not only the fact that uh, China has become Africa's largest uh, trading partner. It is for me, it's rapid growth, uh, 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 which show that uh, from on these 20 last years, it uh, gone from 10 billion to more than 200 billion in 20 years. That is remarkable. And it is also said that this growth has occurred in parallel with the economic growth in Africa. One cannot say that it is the, the impact of that growth of trade in, with China that expand the uh, growth in Africa, but it is something that can be used as a factor. And it is also said in some study that it is like at least 20% impact on the African growth is from this uh, trade with China. Uh, we must also um, recognize that, unfortunately, behind these, um, these figures, there is a qualitative and quantitative imbalance on this trade, trading partnership that we should also notice and analyze in order to know how to, to correct it. In fact, in addition to the trade deficit, um, uh, between Africa and China, which is in favor of China, of course. There is also the fact that when we talk about trading between China and Africa, it is in, in fact Af China with some countries, a small number of countries in Africa. Indeed, when we talk about um, uh, exports from, from China to Africa, 60% of, of, of these is just going to, to six countries like uh, South Africa, 21%, Egypt, Egypt, 12%, Nigeria, 10%, Algeria, Morocco, and Benin, and so on. For import from Africa to China, more than 70%, just also very small number. Angola, South Africa, Sudan, Congo Republic. And this is something that we should analyze and to see how this should be correct in order to strengthen the good things that we have in this partnership and to reduce the challenges on, on it. And this is what I, uh, uh, it was my feeling when I was reading the, 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 the speech from the, uh, His Excellency President Xi, Xi Jinping, when he was presenting these 
Vision 2035 for Africa-China cooperation. When he said, talked about trade, saying that uh, China will open green lines for African agriculture, uh, agricultural export to China, speed up inspection and quarantine procedures, and expand the crop of product benefiting uh, from zero tariff treatment to, uh, for the least developing countries that are in WTO and so on, uh, with develop, uh, uh, diplomatic relations with China and so on. This is something very important. And he, he also announced that China will provide 10 billion uh, in trade finance to support African exports uh, uh, and build a China Africa Pioneer Zone and so on. And also he talked about supporting the IFCFTA, which is now a flagship, something very important for the continent and the African continent. Let me talk very quickly about this African uh, continental free trade area. In my view, this is uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge where we should look at. Every, every, everyone agrees that the IFCFTA will offer to Africa an excellent opportunity for its structural transformation. It should support Africa's industrial uh, transformation, stimulating trade, but in particular, in the stimulating industrialization through trade, which, which is something very important and product, um, promoting also the, pro, um, the, the development of, of the productive capacities in African countries. This is so, so this is very important for Africa, but everyone knows also that one of the challenges of this IFCFTA is that Africa's structural weaknesses on productive capacity. And this is why I think uh, the partnership with Africa, China must um, aim to support African countries on their effort for industrialization and structural transformation. The African market is vast, as we all know. There is tremendous potential for value chain development, especially in areas of agri-food, digital services, and so on. And in this context, I think growing trade with China, the challenge on, of industrialization should be in the center of what we are talking about. And one of the things that I want to point in order to take it as a kind of model or, or um, uh, an, uh, an experience that we can build on is what is uh, already being uh, uh, processed, it is going, and it is from the, the Chinese um, experience on development. There is an important or interesting model here in, um, the, on, based on the, the special economic zones. There is no doubt now that uh, um, China has become one of the most successful countries in these recent years in creating and managing uh, uh, special economic zones. You know that in 2019, there was more than uh, 5,300 and so on special economic zones in the world, but more than 4,000 was in, in Asia and 2,546 in China. So China has at least the half of all the special economic zones in the world. And in Africa, the number is very, very small. It is only in 2019, it was just 235 special economic zones in the African countries. More than 30 countries now have installed these special economic zones, but the most known are Mauritius, Ethiopia, Morocco, Egypt, Kenya, Rwanda, and so on. Even here in Senegal, we have some small that are in the, in the being, being built for, for, for that. So I think this is something where we should reinforce the thing because as we know, the exports from Africa to China is, uh, are based on raw material, very uh, uh, processed that are uh, processed products that are um, not really processed, exported to, to China where Africa imports from China, uh, 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 manufacturer goods, and so on. That is not really the good thing for Africa's development and industrialization. We should uh, change this paradigm to shift it in order to go. The special economic zones are just one of the things that can be done. We have many others, but this is something that where I, I want to, 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 to insist where China can really uh, uh, help. China is already investing a huge amount of money on this in many different countries. There are some results in some countries. We can talk about Egypt, we can talk about Rwanda, where in the special economic zones, we can see 
countries growing their economy, diversifying uh, with value added new products exported in the global market, in, including China. This is the way to go. And I think for, for, for ending here, in order to, to reinforce what is good on these special economic zones, coming from what the President Xi Jinping said, and how to reinforce the investment in African countries, we should, first of all, uh, take, I think, the uh, challenges or risk that we have already identified in the special economic zones that are already installed in Africa, because we have seen some problems. And in order to, co to correct them, the first thing to do is to include these uh, process and strategies into the national planning and strategy documents, not only something coming from outside and, and be based in the country, it should be in line with the, with the development strategy of each African country. It, we should also have the good special planning because most of the countries, as you can see in Dakar, the biggest part, more than 80 or 90% of the economy is based, located in the West in Dakar. We should see how to expand in the special area, in the geographical area, these special economic zones in the country in order to balance the, 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 the economy everywhere. We should also train. Training and capacity building from Chinese uh, engineers and so on is something which is a key. Because transfers of technology, reinforcing uh, capacity is something that will help African countries to not only being uh, behind China and, 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 and but, uh, and so on, but also uh, 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 supporting uh, from support from China, being able to build something and to be able to, to get also as China did in the past, in the history. So African countries also need to, to, to do that. And finally, we should, uh, it is not from China that have to do it, but the, the African countries had, have to, to establish a transparent and effective regulatory framework for organizing their market. Uh, and encourage uh, joint ventures from uh, Chinese companies and African companies to come together to build uh, uh, their own companies in joint venture manner, but also to support the SMEs, even those that are not in the special economic zones. So we will be able to, from the economic zones, to touch on different sectors of the African economies. And in order to reinforce the production, the cap productive capacities, structural transformation so that the IFCFTA will be something which will be uh, you know, useful because all the African uh, countries will be able to produce and to have something to sell to the African market, but also in the global market. So I thank yeah. you, Anna, that's what I wanted to add to the uh, debate that is going on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Die. I think what you've, what you've shared for us is, is really that it sounds like there's obviously a lot of work uh, from the African side to make this happen, but um, the the opening up of potential, uh, of opening up of trade uh, could be of, of significant importance. But also, as you say, it's, it's the industrialization. Now, Professor Tang Xiaoyang, this is obviously an area of your expertise. You've worked on industrialization, um, not only from, uh, f from the Chinese side, but also how does that relate to the African experience? Is there enough of an emphasis on industrialization? I mean, we're talking about Af the African uh, continent being a huge manufacturing hub uh, as, as both uh, Dr. Mayaki and also um, Ambassador Osman were talking about. How do we see that? And, and how, how also in particular the value addition, um, which is referred to in some of the Africa, in many of the African uh, kind of frameworks, how does that happen? Is, is this expected or in, in the FOCAC announcements or is it just not getting enough focus? What would you say? Hi, uh, thank you very much first, uh, Hannah, for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure to uh, talk with all these uh, excellent panelists on this timely issue. And uh, manufacturing and industrialization is definitely the key driver for development for Africa continent as well as for other parts of the world. And uh, manufacturing, however, it's difficult 
So that's uh, when uh, Foucault talks about industrialization. It doesn't uh, just uh, put uh, uh, over emphasis on manufacturing. It actually sees manufacturing as a part of the entire comprehensive program. Because when we want to uh, really produce uh, uh, good um, products, we not only need factories, but we also need uh, infrastructure to transport. We need a power plant to provide energy. We also need uh, the market to distribute them. So all this, we also need uh, skilled workers and we need a uh, very reasonable and clear taxation and law and security to do that. So I think Foucault, in the end, all these uh, nine action plans, which is announced in this uh, by President Xi's speech, they actually can all be seen as contributing to the manufacturing, to the industrialization and the development. But however, uh, this is a co uh, interrelated uh, 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 aspects. So you cannot uh, just uh, focus only on manufacturing without uh, doing other parts. So that's what I want to say about how Africa can really uh, develop uh, its uh, manufacturing. It's actually the key point is uh, indeed uh, to make Africa a better place for business. So people may just uh, see, uh, including the uh, past uh, decade, some of these uh, African uh, yeah, rising stars, they are talking about manufacturing as if that uh, you can just uh, make Africa a production basis uh, through building some uh, factories, through investing in some, uh, in some uh, just a production basis. But that's far not enough. So actually, uh, the doctor's uh, view on this uh, uh, special economic zone and uh, industry zones, I agree with his uh, analysis on the contrast between the zones in China and also the zones in Africa. I have myself done so much uh, research on that. But what's the reason for this difference? It's not because China you know, just simply give a, has a specialty or expertise on the zones. In fact, when China is building these economic zones, China did not only see these zones as a production basis. China actually makes these zones develop uh, together with the urbanization, together with this uh, uh, market nurturing. So therefore, when you look at this Chinese economic zones today, you just find that they are livable places like Shenzhen, like, <coughs> like Suzhou. These are beautiful cities, actually. Yeah, people live there. They are also very uh, consumers. They have a lot of uh, purchasing powers. And the market grows hand in hand with this uh, production. So that's my argument. You cannot just expect Africa to become an exporting hub to think manufacturing like this. Because of the manufacturing, it must go with the market all together. So therefore, when you talk about Africa being a manufacturing hub, you at the same time, you need to make Africa a really good, attractive market. That's actually a lot of Chinese business. When I did the investigation about Chinese in manufacturing investments, in Africa, actually these are all listed in my book on this co-evolutionary um, pragmatism. I have a section devoted to manufacturing and also to the economic zones. The point is uh, to see this uh, manufacturing, most of the manufacturers uh, from China, they are interested in Africa's market. And they actually, they are, uh, like also what we mentioned, this uh, pharmaceutical business, actually in Mali, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, we already see Chinese investors are uh, producing uh, pharmacies in these countries. And uh, the pan-continent free trade zone, that will be a good opportunity also for Africa to be an even more attractive market through this uh, uh, economy of scale. 
right? So this is the, uh, the way of how Africa can really uh, stimulate its manufacturing, not just depending on foreign uh, yeah, investment, but it's actually through its own uh, improvement of the market conditions. So this is also what I would like to advise the continent to have uh, um, build the continent a better place for business. And then it's, uh, you do not need to target at any Chinese or Indians. In fact, when it's a good business, a good place for business, all the foreign investors, they will come. But as, uh, to become a good place for business, you need uh, the security, you need uh, the legislation and uh, the financial systems. These are all in the Africans' own hand. And uh, China would uh, like to provide all they can to support that because the Chinese investors, they like to see Africa's market grow. They also would like to explore the potentials in the African continent. So in this uh, co connection, I would uh, see that Africa and the Chinese, they will have the common interest to make Africa a good place for business. Yeah, so that's my uh, that's my comment. Thank you, and I think I think we see that in the in the outcomes, the the commitment certainly from the African side to try to improve the business environment, but obviously at the same time there's a need for even more regulation and so on um, in order for technology transfer, of course, uh, the kinds of arrangements that uh, that Dr. Ndia was talking I about. I think we see that uh, as well as the environmental side. Um, I'm hoping we'll have a question from the audience about the environmental side because I think that's a very important one to, to discuss too. Now, before we go to the audience, we have one more distinguished panelist to share um, her reflections. Dr. Dr. Liu Haifang, um, for you, what stands out of the FOCAC agreement? Um, I know you, you are the director of, uh, of, of Africa, for the Center for African Studies. Um, how, in particular, perhaps African students, the digital cooperation, where do you see that heading over the next three years? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hannah, for uh, inv inviting me and then also join this uh, very uh, interesting panel and then to listen to ambassadors and the previous scholars. I think uh, most have been covered and then I think I would uh, um, maybe just uh, add on something from the uh, bottom of my heart. Uh, as an educator, I mostly care about a human being, care about our students. And then uh, just as uh, our previous uh, discussion has been uh, exchanged about uh, like uh, the intellig uh, intelligent uh, finance, this, this kind of a topic, I guess, when we talk about education, if how effort can goes to goes more to education, that's really so called intelligent finance between China and Africa. For me, this is a uh, something uh, we cannot um, emphor, uh, emphasize more. Uh, there is uh, definitely uh, from previous uh, sectors, dimensions, all need a good human resource to participate. Once we have uh, this uh, just uh, um, uh, hot, uh, ready, a new blue plan, we also expect uh, who will going to uh, to implement all these uh, pledges as uh, uh, Ambassador Usman has emphasized. For me, uh, definitely there is still a big need and the pandemic also shows more this kind, this type of a need that we need to care about youth, care about uh, their education. We need to think of uh, in future after, or oh, immediate future after we, uh, the human being finally combat the pandemic and then how we could have a recover, we could recover the economy. And then so all this uh, is really need uh, for us to reflect about education. For me, interestingly, uh, this year's, uh, this new um, new program just had a, a very interesting words uh, or a rather new scheme, they called uh, employment through training scheme. Uh, though before we do have uh, this kind of a training uh, and then since um, 
mid 1990s, China already uh, started to heavily invest in education, uh, such as uh, the J Chinese Government Scholarship Council has been uh, giving more and more. And then last uh, summit in 2018, we even uh, remember uh, the announcement comes out uh, 50,000. Uh, for three years scholarship. And then this year is slightly changed into uh, an employment through training scheme. Why is that? For me, there, there is uh, some gap to address. Previously, Chinese, if we want to check numbers about how many students we have sponsored, uh, we, we, we normally use the word Chinese edu uh, intellectual aid. Uh, this type of a particular term. And then mainly we check, we check numbers from uh, Ministry of Education. But now um, we have seen such a new scheme. I think uh, uh, it really goes to address the gap between the uh, huge number of uh, uh, educate, uh, edu uh, the, the, the students we have sponsored and then um, the need of uh, uh, companies that, um, or in another word, how, as a previous scholar mentioned, uh, the huge uh, demographic pressure from youth uh, population, how they can translate it into useful uh, human resource. So um, to, uh, to say young students, not only as a product from our universities, from different colleges, but I rather see them also as a qualified human resource is very needed at this point, especially if we think of the big number of Chinese company involved uh, different kind of economic activities in African continent. So, uh, we, I, I would rather say this is a sort of a, to address the interconnectivity between education and the human resource need uh, on the market. And then um, how to engage uh, companies to join hands with educators like us and also uh, different types of vocational training organizations, um, be, um, you know, a think tank or civil society or a very professional organizations uh, like those uh, vocational college. Uh, these are all very needed to sort of address those kind of a need. The last mile between uh, job market and uh, the education organizations is uh, very needed. So here we can say this kind of a mechanism can encourage company to have a more uh, active role to play, for instance, to provide an internship for uh, students um, and then also could join hands with uh, universities to have more co collaborations in terms of uh, how to provide a qualified educations within the programs. So for me, this is a really uh, very important um, change. It's not necessarily starting from zero, uh, we all know previous contribution, but now how to synergize uh, both Chinese education corporation previously, as well as a Chinese big involvement from uh, company wise, how uh, they can yeah, help with this, uh, this kind of a transition or uh, transformation from big um, human resource demographic uh, pressure into the demographic uh, divide, divide end. And then for me, there is also a very important uh, dimension to understand this kind of education cooperation. Um, if uh, you remember in the pledges, there is uh, not only to help us to uh, uh, upgrade or build a new school, but also 10,000 high level African professionals. For me, often the case, um, uh, African is re regarded as uh, only the consumer for science technology uh, instead of uh, a creator for new knowledge. This is a uh, quite a uh, uh, ignorant situation. But if uh, we think of uh, in, uh, on yearly base, we each year are seeing great number of uh, 
uh, human resource come out from their uh, universities and then how to encourage them to participate. This big um, program of China-African cooperation is also important. So for me, this would also contribute a lot if we can engage more African professional, encourage them to be more qualified scientists, social scientists to join um, the, the bigger collaborations. Yeah, so in general, I think uh, uh, previous years, we have the same um, uh, the Luban uh, workshops, how they established, but we also say those, um, you know, single program, not very much uh, connected. Nowadays, we have seen connectivities between different kind of element of this uh, education cooperation. And then for me, this is a very important changes. This shows the uh, quality become more important uh, aim or goal for this yeah. uh, uh, education cooperation, but also uh, to diversify, to engage different uh, stakeholders are very important. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leo. And I think, again, you bring us back to this overarching point as well. And, and I'm going to come to the Q&A because many of the questions are more overarching than the specifics. But it seems that there's, you know, one of the biggest challenges has been for this FOCAC, how to continue some of the cooperation programs, how to even shift them into a new direction, including with the involvement of the private sector and improve the private sector cooperation given the COVID-19 challenges. So I think you've, you've helped us understand some of that um, and, and, to, and, and how, for example, the education cooperation element will go forward. And I think um, that helps us to understand other parts as well of, of, of uh, what has been pledged how the new situation needs to be dealt with um, but obviously also the vaccines um, commitment also helps of course uh, if those vaccines um, will continue to support uh, countries to uh, be able to open up their economies of course hopefully also China too will do the same in the education corporation the usual corporation can also resume um, going forwards. Um, now we as, as I mentioned we have a Q&A session we've got uh, 13 minutes exactly for the for the Q&A. So what I might do is um, give a couple of, uh, bring a few of the questions together um, and put those to panelists who would like to, who would like to intervene, but I'm going to ask you to really be super, super short, give us, you know, 30 second response um, to, to, to the question. Not each, not all of you, don't feel that you have to answer every single one, but where you do have a strong view or strong uh, opinion um, and, and expertise, please do, please do share that. Um, so first of all, good, a key question, how do we coordinate African agency? Have we seen, um, more African agency delivered uh, in this in this FOCAC, but but are, when we talk about agency, are we talking about state government agency rather than businesses and, and citizens? What are we really talking about? I know, um, Madam Kaba, you mentioned this, um, but also uh, uh, Dr. Mayaki also mentioned it. So perhaps this is something you could you could help us think about quickly and respond briefly. How do we do that coordination, Madam Kaba? Okay, thank you. Um, let me maybe just, you know, uh, I, from a, an experience uh, as I was um, an economy and finance minister and, and looking at um, funding issues and, and more particularly uh, looking at um, uh, how to better negotiate loans with, uh, with such a partner as China. Um, I, I remember that um, a couple of uh, finance a couple of African finance ministers um, and I met in Washington in 20, um, 2018, um, and um, I think it was uh, during the spring meetings. And, and I remember that uh, we had uh, very intense discussions uh, on how to better harness our African agency to be in a better position to negotiate loans that would be favorable uh, for our um, uh, public finances, for our budgets. Um, and, and the idea really uh, 
quickly emerged, emerged that we needed to meet on, on a more regular basis. Uh, we needed to have um, similar uh, uh, meetings as uh, um, EU finance ministers had. Uh, I remember we discussed that actually with my brother, um, uh, Abbe uh, Selassie from the IMF. So this is a way uh, to, to increase that agency. And this is a way also to uh, really look at uh, uh, the different issues and challenges we were facing. Um, I think that, you know, outside and, and this, and, and what I also insisted on uh, with my uh, finance minister's colleague was to, of course, heavily involve uh, the AU, uh, the also commission, the Economic Commission for Africa, um, and, and, you know, all these multilateral agencies that we can definitely uh, uh, rely on for that. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Mayaki, do you have any thoughts on, on building African agency in engagement with China, but also others? Are we yeah. seeing that happen here? Yeah, I, I thank you very much. First of all, I would like really to uh, enhance the very high quality of the panelist production. I, I learned a lot. I, I would like to mention uh, three quick points. The first one is that uh, Africa has put its house in order regarding quality projects. We are no longer in the 90s and 2000. PIDA, which is in its second phase, has enormously improved the quality of the projects of infrastructure which are being presented. As a matter of fact, we have what we call the 5% agenda uh, related to African pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, the assets under management of these funds is around $1 trillion, $300 billion. Where do they invest? They invest in Australia, UK, and the US. So because they thought that and they found that African infrastructure projects were risky, these has started to change in the last five years because we worked on de-risking on the first hand and secondly, on quality projects. So they invest more in Africa, much more. And we call it 5% because we wanted them to move from 1% to 5%, just 5%. So we have a platform to attract uh, Chinese investments in that domain. So we are no longer in, you know, the previous years where we could say the projects were not of quality. No, we have a pipeline of projects and most of them are regional. But the second point is micro, small and medium enterprises in Africa employ 80% of African workers. Most of these enterprises are in the informal sector. So the role of the state has to be an entrepreneurial role in order to support this informal sector. And informal is not negative. Let us remember that Bill Gates started as an informal operator. So uh, they have a lot of energy. They have a lot of ideas. It's for the state to encourage them so that we move towards an intelligent industrialization. Third point, Africa has been requested among in and we saw it in COP26, to go towards green industrialization. No country in the world in the history of economics has gone through green industrialization. We evidently welcome a transition that will allow us to move from coal to renewable energy, but we cannot do it uh, uh, in, in, in against our industrialization uh, 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 objectives. And lastly, a, a very good point was made regarding manufacturing. Manufacturing capacities are evidently about infrastructure, market, access to finance, etc. But fundamentally, it's about the knowledge which is in the brains of the workers. So that education dimension is fundamental. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a very good reminder, in fact, and, and uh, Madame Kaba was also reminding us that the trade financing commitment, one of the other commitments in the this FOCAC is quite unique, interesting for 
uh, channeling credit lines to African financial institutions with a priority to SMEs. So I perhaps the new uh, this new FOCAP plan will go in that direction. Um, we will see we will see that happen. Absolutely. Um, yeah, which would be which would be excellent. Um, but as you say, there's a there's a massive uh, there's a massive jump in terms of the environmental the environmental challenge for that industrialization. We have another question uh, which has just come in um, in terms of how how to bring together the different initiatives, and this is targeted at um, at uh, Professor Liu Haifang, and and I think many maybe some other, some other of our, our Chinese colleagues can uh, can elaborate on this. How does it actually come together? There's so much which is um, perhaps separate for on education and agriculture and health, how do they all add up? And it's different ministries taking them forward. How do they add up? How do African, um, African stakeholders, in fact, engage with them directly? Professor Liu, uh, and also Ambassador Go, you may also want to, to reflect on this one. So may I, I, yes, may I further uh, elaborate on, uh, to continue to, to, to my topic on the people-to-people -people, uh, uh, exchanges, sure. uh, which is uh, actually both Chinese uh, at the age of, uh, you know, I'm in my 60s, I think I, I'm at a better pos position to talk about the youth. Uh, both Chinese and uh, Africa, especially the young people are big consumers of you know the movies, so uh, actually I, I, I fully agree with uh, Madame Kaba, you know, uh, with uh, what is she described as intelligence finance, or I would rather call it a smart investment. You know, how can we set up a kind of mechanism uh, for invest in the entertainment industry or movie industry in particular? You know, I. You know, Chinese and and America and Africa, uh, uh, Chinese and Africa have the, a long history of ex exchanges. You know, since the 60s of last century, the Chinese leadership, the, the Premier Zhou Enlai visits uh, Africa, ten countries, and uh, for example, some uh, African leaders uh, are very close comrades or friends of the Chinese leaders, like uh, Molimu Nyerere, the founding father of Tanzania, and there are many touching stories of. Tanzara, you know, uh, the Chinese medical volunteers. Ambassador Go, Bachelor. Ambassador Go, I'm so sorry. We have two minutes left of this of the of the discussion. So, would you give us your thoughts in in kind of thirty okay. seconds? Yeah. Of, so, I, I, want uh, my, I, yeah, I strongly I advocate that so you know, we we should set up the mechanism set up in the investment of the uh, the movie industry. I uh, let's say you know. Nigeria has a, a, a very famous uh, Nollywood, you know, which produces 2,000 yeah. movies every year. So we can have a better cooperation, you know. This is a Absolutely. big market. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Absolutely, the creative industry is growing. We see it, we see it all around us and definitely it should be a great new area of, co of cooperation and collaboration. Um, also linking in, into IP, intellectual property. Can, one last question for our panelists. Um, there was a question about how this FOCAC being a bit more transparent than last time. Um, the speeches were all um, played live. Uh, what's, is, is, was that intentional? Is that something different? Does, would anyone be willing to co comment on that perhaps? Is that responding to, responding to citizens wanting to know more information? Perhaps about the process, Professor Tang. Uh, in Chinese uh, uh, government, they are open to communicate with uh, a lot of uh, African stakeholders, as long as that's equal for everybody. Because of the Chinese agencies, they are a lot of them, even they are state-owned enterprises, they are businesses. 
So therefore, they just like other businesses, they will keep their commercial, uh, yeah, this uh, confidentiality. But if Africa makes uh, this uh, regulations, like in Cameroon, if say all the loans, they should be transparent, China would conform to that. So if the African governments or the African citizens want to be more transparent, simply make the rule. Because China doesn't want to be singled out as the only one who need to be transparent. But China is willing to be transparent just as other businesses. Yep. Okay, that's just my comment. Thank you so much. Very key for people to realize it's it's about national rules and national laws. So um, let's all for and I guess Senegal. Um, we're also very keen uh, to make sure that this FOCAC itself is also as transparent and, and open as possible for, uh, for people to understand the outcomes as quickly as possible. Um, okay, so thank you so much, everyone. We really have no more time for questions, um, but I think today has been very, very informative. I've certainly learned a lot, and, uh, as Dr. Mayaki was saying, um, but we also learned, we also learned from, from all, of our, um, all of our guests today. Um, I think one thing that really struck me about FOCAC and I think is worth reiterating about the FOCAC mechanism is, and I think it's really come out through our discussion today. In Chinese, there's a phrase, and I, I, I'm going to apologize for my poor tones, um, which means um, the government sets the stage and then the business plays the drama. And I think it's not just the, the business, it's also citizens who play the drama. So what we have through FOCAC is the stage for the future cooperation. I think we have a stage for a much longer term cooperation being set today through this FOCAC. And what we now have is how do we, businesses, citizens, uh, people, um, and sub-regional governments as well, um, also go and take this forward. Um, so thank you, everyone. Let's all go and take that forward. Let's do some more understanding, more cooperation, um, more collaboration going forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, to our partners, China Center for Globalization. And thank you to all our distinguished guests for joining us and sharing your fabulous insights with us and to our uh, audience, our participants who really did participate with really fantastic questions. Thank you all and uh, come, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.